Welcome to the video tutorial on ionic compounds, formula units, and nomenclature. So this is a very important fundamental concept that will build off our understanding of ions, right? So we know that ions um, occur because atoms can gain or lose electrons to become ions. So cations, that is the term to describe I'll leave a pause there for you to fill in the blanks, right? That would be a positive ion. And then anions, of course, are negative ions. So, if you're having trouble keeping these straight, remember that the T in cation resembles the plus sign. So that reminds us that cations are positive. And then anions, with that N there, are negative. And so, when we have a neutral atom, there is no charge. Remember that when we have a cation forming or an anion forming, that the top right corner, the right superscript, is where we indicate the charge on, of when an element, when it is in its ionic form. Okay, now the octet rule for ionic bonds is where atoms will gain or lose electrons to achieve a full valence shell of eight electrons. So if the atoms are gaining electrons, they become an anion, and if they lose electrons, they become a cation, right? So it's that um, kind of counterintuitive effect we have because electrons are negative, right? So cations form by losing electrons, and anions form by gaining electrons. And then, if we tie this to our understanding of the periodic table with the stair step line, right? So if we look at the periodic table, we should always see the stair step line, right? That separates the metals from the nonmetals. All right. And so that it helps us to predict the type of ions that will form. Metals like to lose electrons to form cations. Nonmetals are like to gain electrons to form anions. Now, these ions come together to um, create neutral salts. So ionic compounds um, are also described as salts. And that's one of those things that just tends to slide into chemistry classes without a formal introduction. So I would like to formally introduce you to ionic compounds when they're described as neutral salts, right? So the cation charge is going to, positive charge is going to be attracted to the anion. And so, I don't like the way I drew that. Right, so they're going to be attracted to each other. And so that's what's going to create the crystal lattice. Now, the important thing here is that we have to make sure that the total positive charge is equal to the total negative charge. And so that is how we create the chemical formulas for ionic compounds. To creating the chemical formula is we have to figure out the ratio of the ions so that our total positive charge equals our total negative charge. So, for example, let's say we had a magnesium ion, which is plus 2, and a chloride ion that's minus 1. Here we have a total positive charge of plus 2. Chloride only has the ability to bring in a minus 1. So we are going to need two chloride ions to create an overall negative 2 charge. So when we write the chemical formula for this ionic compound, it will be magnesium with Cl2. Now it's important to note that when we write the chemical formula, notice that we do not show the charge of the ions. We simply, and so we use the bottom right corner, the right subscript, to show the ratio. We never show the, the ones. 
So this is understood to be a 1 to 2 ratio. 1 magnesium to 2 chloride ions. They will be attracted to each other electro electrostatically. They will create a crystal lattice for the solid magnesium chloride. Now, the useful thing or helpful thing about ionic compounds is naming follows the same pattern as the chemical formula. We are always going to have the cation first, followed by the anion, which is second. And the names are a bit of a puzzle. All we need to know is which ions are present. And then it's a puzzle that we can figure out the ratio to create the neutral compound. So let's practice this skill together. All right, with our first example, we have potassium and bromide. This is a very straightforward example because we have plus one and minus one. So we already are creating a neutral compound with a one-to-one -one ratio. So we list our cation first and our anion second. And the name of this cation is potassium. And the name of this anion is bromide. All right. Oh, now here's magnesium's back for an encore, right? Magnesium gives us a positive two charge. Each of the hydroxide ions is only minus one. To create a neutral compound, we are going to need to have two hydroxides so that we have a plus two and a minus two. So that tells us that the ratio here is going to be 1 to 2. We will have 1 magnesium. Now with polyatomic ions, anytime we have more than one of a poly polyatomic ion, we enclose its formula in parentheses. So there is our 1 to 2 ratio. The name is very straightforward. The name of this ion is magnesium. And the name of this anion is hydroxide. So notice that this works. If we just read the name magnesium hydroxide, we would know magnesium is 2 plus and hydroxide is minus 1. And because of our understanding of chemistry, we know that these ions must come together in a 1 to 2 ratio to create the neutral compound. All right, let's look at one, another example. Here we have iron 2. So remember that iron is a transition metal and it has the ability to form more than one oxidation state. So the name of this ion is iron with a Roman numeral 2. All right, so we have a plus 2 coming from the iron. And then we have phosphate, which is a minus 3. So now we need to bring these ions together in a ratio that will create a neutral compound. At this point, it can be very helpful to think about the multiples, right? We want to find the least common multiple. So the iron 2 can only come in in increments of plus 2. The phosphate can only come in in increments of minus 3. So we can see that the least common multiple would be 6. We are going to need 3 iron 2's to create a plus 6 that will balance 2 phosphates creating a minus 6 so that we can achieve a neutral compound. So there's our iron, two, we're going to need three of those. And then we would have our phosphate, and we're going to need two of those. So there's our chemical formula. So here's the chemical formula for the, com the compound, iron, two, phosphate. This can be very confusing. Sometimes people could think that the Roman numeral is telling us the number 
of iron ions in the compound, and that is not correct. Remember that the iron 2 is telling us we have iron plus 2 in our formula. Alrighty. Sometimes people like to use the crisscross method. So, um, for example, with the iron 2 and the phosphate, we could crisscross the charges over and get the answer that we see right here. And in many cases, the crisscross method works great. But here's an example where it doesn't work. If we try to use the crisscross method here, we have lead 4. And remember, lead is a, is a element that has more than one oxidation state, so we have to include the Roman numeral. And then there's our buddy carbonate. So in this case, if we tried to use the crisscross method, we would end up with, I'll just do it in red, we would end up with two phosphates and four carbonates. Now this is not a correct chemical formula. Why? Because we always want to have the smallest ratio of whole numbers. And so here we can see that there is a multiple of two. So we would want to reduce this to is going to be one lead four and two carbonates. So if you decide to use the crisscross method, make sure to look at your ratio for common factors that can be reduced. The other way to do it is to think about multiples. We have lead 4 plus and carbonate 2 minus. So the least common multiple will be 4. So that tells us that we only need one lead, but we will need two carbonates. Right? So if we'll draw this out one more time. Yeah, so I guess we'll just show it here. Right? So it would take one lead to make plus four and two carbonates to make minus four. So we would still end up with the same chemical formula and then um, making sure that we're good on our ion names, it's simply lead four carbonate. Alrighty, let's see. Um, and now We'll do one last bit of wrap-up to um, show how we can use our understanding of the chemical formulas and nomenclature of ionic compounds, and then we can apply it to solution chemistry. So on our last page here, um, ionic compounds are solids in their pure state. The ions are locked together in the crystal lattice creating, created by the cations and anions, maximizing their attractive forces and minimizing their repulsive forces. So then let's keep in mind what happens to ionic compounds when they dissolve in water. So let's take an example like um, sodium carbonate. So if this is an example of sodium carbonate, here it is as a solid. So then remember that if we add this to water, right, the water is going to pull apart the sodium ions and the carbonate ions through intermolecular forces. And if you want a review of that, there is a tutorial that talks about intermolecular forces with solution formation. And the important thing to remember is that when we add the sodium carbonate, to the water and it dissolves, those sodium ions become independent. For every formula unit of sodium carbonate, we will release two sodium ions and one carbonate ion. And so for ionic compounds in particular, we go from a single compound to three independent solute ions. All right.
Alrighty, so as you're working with the ionic compounds, remember to keep the idea of their ratio in your mind. So let's predict how many ions are released into an aqueous solution when one formula unit is dissolved in water. And let's go ahead and write our answers like a chemical reaction. So we're starting with potassium phosphate, and then we're going to dissolve it in water. And so we see that we have a ratio of three potassiums to one phosphate. So this would create three potassium ions and one phosphate ion. All right, so now we'll work a few more examples together to have you feel confident as you approach your homework. So once again, this would be sodium acetate. It's also a solid that we can dissolve in water. So here we have a one-to-one -one ratio. So we would have one sodium ion dissolved in water and one acetate ion dissolved in water. So remember also that, right, when we talk about the ions independently, it's important to show their charge. But when we have a, a compound, the formula unit, the charges are hidden. That's why you've spent so much energy memorizing them. And then last but not least, here we have a compound, and this is a good one. Here we have copper. What is the form of copper here? We, want, we have to look at the anion. All right, so we know that this anion is nitrate with a minus one. And we see that we have two of them. So the net anionic charge is minus two. So to create the neutral salt, we recognize that copper must be plus two. So when we add this solid to water, we will have copper two plus and two nitrate ions. So I think just to, to finish up, Let's make sure that we have all of the names for these ionic compounds. So this first compound here, or this compound here with copper, that would be copper to nitrate. This would be sodium acetate and potassium phosphate. Okay, so, um, so this concludes the ionic compound tutorial, giving you some practice in determining formula units and a review of the nomenclature rules, and then some context for how you'll use this information as the course continues. So please take some time now to work a few homework problems to reinforce your understanding.